Hmm. Interesting. Well, um, I I will um, talk to you, and then I'll probably talk to Audric about that because I think Audric would actually know a little bit more, you know, because he's he's kind of from around there, and uh, he 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 probably could give he probably could quantify whether or not it's a you know a feeling or if it's a reality. Yeah. I will, I will say this, when I was going to grad school, I visited two places. I visited SUNY Stony Brook and uh, University of Maryland College Park. And University of Maryland College Park, the, I think it was the chairperson of physics at the time. The chairperson of physics, I think, picked me up and like, I think, I think his stereo was missing or something because it had gotten stolen and he was, I mean, car was kind of a mess. He was apologizing for it because it just got broken into or something. <laughs> it's like, wait, what? Never mind, I don't want to go here. I mean, <laughs> now, in the time I was at Stony Brook, I did have, like, one of my friends, th they, these idiots um, broke into his car twice, both times breaking the sunroof. He's just like, could you break a regular window? Like, the sunroof is super expensive. Like, so annoying. So, and then when I was in grad school at NC State, one of, I wasn't close to him or anything, but one of my classmates, he got like, beat, he got beat really bad. Like, I think he was incapacitated for like a couple months. Like, he got beat near, near death because somebody just broke into his apartment because they thought he was the drug dealer who lived next to him or something. And that's just the situation. Like you end up in, the, in apartments where you're kind of near unsavory characters. I think I lived under a drug dealer when I was in grad school. I don't know why else he was outside at two in the morning. Like it wasn't, I think it was my brother, not me, but went outside at like two in the morning, take the trash to the trash can. Some guy's out there, it's raining. He's like, dude, I got it. Like, why are you standing outside at two in the morning? <laughs> Just like waiting for, I mean, he's waiting for somebody to come to make a deal, right? I mean, that's, that's what's going on. You're up because you're in math. <sighs> yeah. I was probably sleeping, but I was pretty. No, I'll leave it. It's fine. I'll, I'll leave it. This is, people don't want to hear about math. They want to hear random stories of our life, you know? <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right, so we are in. The, um, oh, I guess I should pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and again, I thank you for this class and these students. Just ask that you bless our work today, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So, yeah, we're um, knee deep in differential forms in the wedge product, and I guess I should try to like finish up. So, we kind of worked through about half of the formalism, but not all of it. And so, I argued that the dimension of the uh, anti-symmetric tensors was given by like n choose k um, so we're in chapter 14 um, I'll just call this lecture differential forms on a manifold All right, so um, <clears throat> let me just get straight to the point here. Um, so these um, are essentially the, 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 the four, let's say, omega, omega prime, eta, eta prime, and, uh, well, he's got a zeta here. I hate zeta. Let me make that a, let me make that a gamma. There we go. These are, he calls them multi-covectors. <laughs> multi-covectors. Um, and then you've got, you got various properties of the multi-covectors under the wedge product, all right? So let me just write those out. Because that's essentially the point here is that 
for the um, for the alternating uh, K tensors, co alternating K covariant tensors. Um, so I, well, let me get to it. First of all, if you have like A omega plus, let's say B omega prime wedge eta, you've got you know A omega wedge eta plus B omega prime wedge eta. All right, you're dead. <clears throat> Oof. I should warn you guys, I'm sick, so I will at some point just do something entirely crazy today. So watch for that. Uh, sure. Um, also, if you have eta wedge A um, omega plus B omega prime, you get well, A eta wedge omega plus B eta wedge um, omega prime. So this, this wedge product, it's, it's bilinear. He calls these two things bilinearity. I'm, I'm writing down proposition 14.11. 4, these are derived consequences for the wedge product which he builds in a way which I'll tell you after I write down the properties. Because the properties are more important than the definition, honestly. The other property, and this is huge, is that omega wedge eta wedge gamma makes sense. Omega wedge eta wedge gamma makes sense in the sense that I can add parentheses. In other words, the wedge product is associative. It's an associative product. Just like the tensor product is associative. All right. Tensor product's associative. Um, wedge product's associative. There is a place where the cross product and the wedge product differ, right? Cross product is not associative. Um, and we can measure the departure from associativity with the Jacobi identity, right? That homework problem you guys had about the uh, cross product in R3 forming a Lie algebra. And then here's an interesting one. Omega wedge eta is equal to minus one to let's say KL eta wedge omega. And here, let us be specific. Omega is a K form over the dual to V, and eta is a L form um, over the dual to V. So a K covariant tensor, an L covariant tensor. So the wedge product is not commutative, it's, it's, it's graded commutative. Yeah graded commutivity. To commutive, I can't spell. All right, good enough. Um, <clears throat> what else? <coughs> um, now, uh, oh, 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 oh. So I guess this was technically like A, B, C. So these guys are like A. I believe this is B. This right here is C. And then D is, D and E are going to connect with some of the, uh, the things we started doing last time, Preston. Like D says that if you take epsilon I1 wedge epsilon I2 wedge da, 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 wedge epsilon IK, it's equal to epsilon big upper I, where I is equal to I1, I2, da da da, da IK. And, um, and that, that's a Okay, yeah, that's, there's no, no fine print. It's for any multi-index. Now here, um, you have epsilon one, epsilon two, da da da, epsilon n, basis for V dual. And like, last time we defined, uh, Ernesto, we, we defined this epsilon i symbol as follows, like epsilon i, acting on a k-tuple of vectors 
was equal to like the determinant of um, oh goodness gracious how did it go um, v1 i1 v2 i2 da 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 v k i k da, 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 v1 i uh, v1 how did it go v1 i k i guess it was v2 i k v that can't be i k I did something wrong here. Just a second. Let me fix it. I think I did this last time too, didn't I, Preston? Something wrong. And so, like, what this is supposed to be is uno, uno, uno. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uno, uno, uno. <coughs> so what it does is it takes the determinant of the uh, coordinate vector. It takes the determinant of the subvectors of the coordinates that correspond to the indices which forming the multi-index I. <sighs> that. So that's what the epsilon big I means. It's a way of, and this is for, you know, this is for I equals to I1, I2, I, IK. So like, there's various things that are fairly clear about this epsilon big I symbol. Like for instance, the epsilon big I, if you have any multi-index in here repeated, right, it, you can see this, if I've got like, if I've got like I is I I, you know, it they don't have to be adjacent, but there's like I over here somewhere, right? Then epsilon I is, is clearly going to be equal to zero because it's going to give you a repeated column. So the fact that that is equal to this immediately says that this wedge product, the wedge product that's being defined and I haven't explained how this is defined yet, by the way. Okay? I'm putting the cart before the horse, if you will. But that would then say that the, if you have a wedge product of one forms, or, or covectors rather, if there's any repeat, zero. Okay? Again, I haven't yet defined the wedge product that I'm writing the properties of here yet. I will in a minute. And then, um, oh, in the case of, in the case you've got, uh, Oh, who? Uh, uh. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, well, I was not expecting that, but whatever. All right, so if we've got omega, omega one, wedge omega two, wedge, wedge omega k, and you feed that thing a k-tuple of vectors, v1, v2, and da 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 vk, well, that's nothing more than the determinant of the matrix omega, like i, vj. You might be like, well, which one's the row and which one's the column? The answer is, it doesn't matter, it's a determinant. All right, so um, how, you know, how, how do we define, so that's how we define the epsilon i last time, and it has some properties that we talked about. Um, like, for example, we, the main, the main, the, probably the most interesting thing I said in the general context last time was that, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> <coughs> is this guy, the K covariant, the K covariant tensors over V dual has as its basis the span of, let's say, beta K, where beta K, I, I just said, well, what that is, is uh, epsilon I such that I is increasing, strictly increasing, really. Uh, multi-index. See, because then if you count the number of things in this, it's n choose k, where, you know, n is the dimension of v dual. 
So that so just shows us that the dimension of the k covariant tensors is in fact n choose k. Which then, you can define the exterior algebra. We, I guess we're not quite, we're kind of getting to that. We haven't quite done it yet. But um, this, I usually use omega for it. Omega over v dual is something like, you know, it's equal to the direct sum k equals zero to n of uh, lambda k of v dual. And, you know, if you add, this is a theorem, this is a fun thing to prove. If you add n choose k, um, you know, from zero to n like that, you get two to the n. So, you know, dimension of the uh, whole exterior algebra, two to the n. For example, we looked at R3 last time, Preston. And if you look at what we had, we had functions, one forms, two forms, three forms. One, of fun one kind of function, uh, the basis at a given point, three, three dimensions for one forms, three dimensions for two forms, one dimension for three forms. That's eight. Two to the third, eight. Not an accident. Um, of course, I should be careful. Like, it's not a basis in the sense of a vector space uh, because, you know, the, uh, the set of uh, differential one forms, for example, is not a, um, well, it is a vector space in an infinite dimensional sense, but it's, it's, it, it has a module basis, if you will. You know, like the functions I could think of as being, con as being smooth functions. I mean, the constants, the scalars in some sense are smooth functions for that thing. Anyway, I'll shut up about that. Um, <clears throat> at a point, it's definitely a vector space. And you could say at a point, at a point, I mean, this is all for a given vector space, right? This is all, like this algebra here we're talking about is, is for a specific vector space, which we could think of as the tangent, like the cotangent space at a point, yeah? Um, so in that context, we're just talking about finite dimensional vector space stuff. But we're really more interested in differential forms, which are really uh, covariant k-tensor fields. You know, it's a, it's a, it's an, it's a, we're putting a, a k covariant tensor at each point in the manifold and connecting them in a smooth, in a smooth fashion. That's really what we're, we're more interested in. All right. So all of this to say we haven't, um, I haven't explained how do you take the wedge product of two, like we've, ex I've explained to you how to build the, uh, we had a definition for, um, This is why I was saying I should finish it last time. <laughs> um, so I defined the alternating, like alt. We defined alt last time, you know, which is on page 351. So I won't go over that again, but we defined alt. And that, so what that does is it gives you, um, a way of anti-symmetrizing a given, you know, k-covariant tensor. And then we looked at the properties of the epsilon with the multi-index. And, okay, fair enough. So we actually haven't introduced the wedge product last time, except in the example of R3. That's right. Okay, so now here's the definition of the wedge product. So what I'm trying to say to you guys is that this is what we want for a wedge product. Like abstractly, this is what you want a wedge product to be. Is it's something that allows you to take um, like multi vectors, or in this case, multi covectors, and put them together to get, you know, uh, multi vectors that are of like larger um, rank, if you want to call that rank. Like, you know, so like if omega and omega prime are both like k vectors and eta is a p vector you want like this should be these should all be k plus p vectors all right so like the wedge product has that that about it it's taking so you have an algebra which is graded in the sense that everything in the algebra has a degree which is a you know like a a non-negative integer so you have like zero degree things one degree things two degree things and this wedge product whatever it is it has the it has the product it's something like this, like, you know, if I take lambda, um, let's say k over v dual, and I wedge it with things from 
cam, cam, lambda p over v dual, right? Then that should be a subset of lambda k plus p of v dual. I don't, I don't know if that's captured in my, I'm not sure that's really captured in the proposition, but that is something I would want from the axiomatic formulation of a wedge product. See, um, whenever you come to a new algebraic structure, there's, there's two different things you want to think about. The one thing you want to think about is, how do you actually create it, like, concretely? How can you make it from things you already know? That's one question you can ask. So in other words, what's a model? What's a model of the algebraic structure you're looking at? But the other question, which is in some sense more important, is what fundamental properties define that model as what it is? You know, so like for the complex numbers, it's a good example. We can look at complex numbers as two by two matrices of a particular, you know, real matrices of a particular type, right? A minus B, B A. Those matrices under matrix multiplication, for all intents and purposes, behave as the complex numbers. Or we could take the ring of polynomials and mod by the principal ideal generated by x squared plus one. That, in essence, makes x squared equals to minus one. It makes x serve in the quotient ring as the imaginary number i. Those are two wholly separate ways of creating a quote unquote complex number system, but they both share in property the basic algebraic rules, which is that complex multiplication is distributed from the right and the left, it's commutative. There's something called i in it that squares to be the negative of the multiplicative identity of the algebra. These things are what make the complex numbers the complex numbers. So any model, like is, are the complex numbers matrices? Are the complex numbers you know, uh, equivalence class of uh, polynomials, if you want them to be, but they don't have to be, right? We can think of trying to define things by their properties. It's a, yeah, question? When we replace <coughs> this, when we let b equals the real numbers, do we have the super numbers? Oh, when we, let b be, when we let b be the real numbers, do we have the super numbers? That is how the Grassman multiplication is, and it works, yeah. I think I saw it defined that way in Wikipedia. Um, Whoa, I was not thinking about super numbers for today. My goodness. <laughs> Whoa, dude. That's what they did in 357. So the thing is, in V-Dual, I only have n dimensions to work with. Yeah. Um, finitely generated super numbers. Right. Oh, so this would, so this would be fi finitely generated super numbers? Yes, finitely generated super numbers really are just the exterior algebra. Um, okay. Yeah, that's fair enough. Rogers. Yeah, in Rogers, that's not wrong. You're not wrong. So, like, if you have three generators, for example, the uh, um, the super numbers which are generated from from three generators are an eight-dimensional real vector space. Yeah, and a lot of her early, like, her interesting paper on topology in like 1980, very much works from the fact that the supermanifold is in fact also a real finite-dimensional manifold to which you're entitled all of the benefits and privileges there unto, namely like transverse ma manifold theories and stuff. The thing we haven't talked much about in here, guys, is like um, for a manifold, for a Ramanian manifold, I don't think I talked about this in the Ramanian manifold, but I probably should have at least a little bit. One of the things that's big in calculus three is like we have a surface, right? But then we do stuff with the normal to the surface, right? You have a curve. But you can also think about things that are like normal to the curve. I mean, there's a whole normal plane to the curve, really, right? Um, and there's that kind of, you can do that kind of thing in a finite dimensional Ramanian manifold as well, because you can look at like for a subspace, for a submanifold, right? You can look at um, the directions in some sense in the manifold which are perpendicular to the tangent space you can form the orthogonal complement to the tangent space at a point, and then you can flow off those normal directions and, d and generate like a, a normal, a normal submanifold to a given submanifold. I don't know much about that world, but I know that this is like these, tra these theorems about transversality and so forth, like these things are used, it's a technical like beastly machine which deeper results in differential topology I think are, are found from. And I, I think this was a large part of like the course, for example, Spencer had out of a book I don't have, um, but he had like his, he had a course in differential topology, and I think they spent a lot of time like looking at uh, transverse submanifolds and things like that. Because 
if you have like a submanifold and the transverse submanifold, it's it's got like it's filling the whole manifold. It's so if you can you know fill the whole manifold, you probably can say things about how things are sorting out. And there are things you could do with it to answer questions. Is all I'm saying. But we haven't done. That. But my my point is like in, in calculus three we do that. We just take the cross product of this of the you know the partial velocities and then we get the normal vector field right and. We use that for all kinds of calculational purposes in Calc 3. There is an analog to that in Ramanian manifolds in terms of, I think he called it the normal bundle to a submanifold. I think that was in there. It's like a little subsection in the Ramanian manifold. Um, I think so. Give me a second, I'll tell you. Uh, the two. Oh yeah, normal bundle, page 337. It's actually like a paragraph. <laughs> So, but that paragraph, I think, blows up into a significant, mar a significant part of the uh, differential topology people. Anyway, yeah? You're saying something? <laughs> <laughs> ah! Excuse me. Wedge product. So, um, you know, for the wedge product, I would want it to have this property that it's an exterior operation in the sense that you know, you take something that's a K form, you take something that's a P form, you get a K plus P form. Um, it's got the bilinearity, it's got the associativity, it's got this graded commutivity, all right? Um, I think if you have all that, then you probably can build D and E from those. I think D and E can be built from those, okay? <laughs> um, I think if you look at the proof that's in Lee, basically what he's doing is he's hanging his hat on this formula and then he's using this formula as a means to get this theorem I just told you about, which then gives him that if you have any two covectors repeated in a wedge product, it's zero. And then he bootstraps his way up to higher wedge forms by the definition I'm about to write. So here's his, this is 14.3. This is his honest to goodness definition of the wedge product for a K plus L covector. Here's how it goes. Omega wedge eta. Um, is equal to k plus l factorial divided by k factorial l factorial alt <laughs> of the tensor product of omega and eta. <clears throat> he says this mysterious coefficient is motivated by the simplicity of the statement and the following dilemma. All right, so his point is that <laughs> this implies that if you have epsilon i wedge epsilon j, you get epsilon ij. So, all right, and let's 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 actually try to flesh this out for like three things, because I'll feel better about my day if I do that. Um, all right, so let's see here. I think last time we said alt. What was alt of two, like alt of two covectors? We wrote that down, right? What was it? Uh, alt of, on page 351, if we look at the definition of alt, alt of two things, well, alt beta, so beta is a, a two, a two, uh, two tensor, uh, two covariant tensor. Acting on beta w is one half beta v w minus beta w v. All right. Um, so let's see if we can sort through this. What happens if we look at like? Alpha, what's alpha wedge beta? Oh, beta's a bad choice. Alpha wedge gamma. Oh, no, alpha wedge eta. How about that? Oh, well, how about omega wedge? I'll get it eventually. Omega wedge eta. Why not just stick with the same letters? 
But these are both, suppose these are both one forms. Or if you like, let me just be where we are and do what we're doing. Covectors. A covector is the word we try to use for a one form at a point. OK? Um, all right, there we go. And uh, oh, I guess to make sense of this, well, OK, first of all, let me just do this. So k and l, k equals l equals 1, right? So we've got 2 factorial divided by 1 factorial times 1 factorial, also known as 2, <laughs> right? 2 times alt of omega tensor eta. All right. Um, OK. I guess I should let this thing act on a pair of vectors to understand it more, right? Resisting urge to go into coordinates must resist urge. Uh, VW. Maybe not W. Let's do X and Y. How about that? Why not? Um, so that's 2 times the alt of um, <coughs> excuse me, omega tensor eta, right? And that acts on oh, x, y energy running low. All right, so then the half and the two, they cancel each other, yeah? And then we got ourselves a uh, omega tensor eta acting on xy minus omega tensor eta acting on what? Uh, yx, right? Do you guys follow me? All right, so then what? Well, what is it? We, we redefined this previously, right? So this is like omega of x, eta of y, minus omega of y, eta of x, right? Which we could, these are just numbers. So we could write that like uh, omega of x, eta of y, minus eta of x, omega of y. I just flipped, right? And then this, this is straight up omega tensor eta minus eta tensor omega, all acting on x, y. But this holds for all x and y. Therefore, apparently, omega wedge eta is equal to omega tensor eta minus eta tensor omega. Did I say this before? Did I claim this? You might have several lectures ago. OK. Like, I didn't put a half there, did I? You might have. Dang it. <laughs> Dang it. Because sometimes people put a half here. I did I put a half? I remember a half being next to something that looked like that. Let's find it. How long ago would it have been? I don't know if I've ever done it. Done it. I, I, I may just. Hopefully, I didn't. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Covectors alpha beta alpha wedge beta equals one half. Dang it. <laughs> one half. Yeah. Yeah. This is one half right there. Rats. Uh, what day was this? March nineteenth, twenty twenty four. Oh. Disagrees. Why do people put a one half? 
So 324, 24 or 19? 319.24. All right, so I think though, if you look at the totality of that lecture, it was kind of a throwaway comment, right? Um, yeah, because you, you didn't even talk about the I just wanted to throw something out there that was wrong, and so I managed to do that successfully. This is the thing that you planned that was going to be. Yeah, so apparently the, defi so apparently the, um, the definitions in Lee, unless I'm making some hideous miscalculation right here, don't put the factorial sign in front of the actual wedge product to covectors. I'm just warning you, different books, and he talks about this, the other way of defining the wedge product. So like the other way of defining the wedge product, it, 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 it weasels the combinatorial factor into this thing, whereas he's put it into that thing. Some way or another, you have to face the, the combinatorics, you know, and like, so, and Lee explains his reasons for doing it this way as opposed to the other way. And basically, he more or less says both points, both viewpoints have their merits. So it's just one of those, one of those things. But I can't say what I said before and say this. So let us stick with, with Lee. Um, in a homework problem I've assigned, I think I've, well, we, you guys can come ask me about that homework problem when you're ready to understand it. So, the way I see it, you could answer the homework question from one definition or from the other. You know, like it's anyway. Um, all right. So there's that. What happens? Well, how about three things? Can we? What would happen with three things? What if we took like? you know, omega, wedge, eta, wedge, gamma, let's say. That would be what? If these are all one forms, um, we could look at it in terms of like this, right? So it's this wedged with that. So the k is 2. We've got 2 plus 1 factorial divided by 2 factorial times 1 factorial, and then the alter alternation of uh, this thing here, omega wedge eta, tensor um, eta apparently, oh gamma. So that's 3 factorial over 2 factorial, which is what? 3? So I've got like 3 alt um, this thing. And probably we should just look at it as 3 alt. Um, you've got, it's, it's omega omega tensor eta tensor gamma minus eta tensor omega tensor gamma, right? Look at it that way. That'll make life easier. Because alt, alt is, um, is linear. All right, so like you can divide and conquer. Um, and probably I need my parentheses here. I'm not sure I need the parentheses there. I'm just a little, a little, a little apprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> guys. Ah, goodness gracious. It's easy. Um, and then to actually put this into practice, I could go back and use the formula on page 351 where we have the alternation of a three, um, of a, of a three, a three covariant vector on three things, which I guess I'll do over here. Um, so let's let's try it out. Why not? Well, we got to lose. I mean, class time, I guess. Um, omega wedge eta wedge gamma, and I'm gonna let that thing act on x y z. Right? Oh, golly, that's nasty. So thrice. 
Ugh, yucky. Ew. Well, so, fine. I've got like, let me kind of write it out symbolically. Yeah? Oh, I'll, I'll get it. If I step on your tablet, it's not my fault. Um, I'm just warning you. I'm not. <laughs> on an ordinary day, in an ordinary day, I'd say it's safe, but today, I don't know. I don't know. So if we go back to that formula, we've got like three sixths, which is one half, right? So you got like one half of um, uh, omega tensor eta tensor gamma. And then let me kind of do it like this. So the way it goes is x, y, z, y, z, x, um, z, x, y, and then minus z, y, x, minus um, y, oy, x, z, minus x, z, y. And then, of course, you got your minus eta tensor omega tensor gamma, same pattern. So if you think about this, how many terms do you got? Six? Six? Twelve? Twelve total terms to sort it through, right? Twelve total terms. So we've got twelve total terms, and let's think about it. All right, let's think about it. We've got omega. Let's think about the omega of x, eta of y, gamma of z terms, right? Where are those coming from? How many of them are there? There's two different ways they can arise, at least. The one, of course, is from this guy, right? I just go into here, you get omega of x, eta of y, gamma of z. Over here, right, over here, we, we want the omega, we want eta of y, right? And we want omega of x. Oh, so that's not, that's not this one. I need y, it's this one, isn't it? See that? So if you can think about this acting on that, that gives me eta of y, omega of x, gamma of z. Uh-oh. Well, not uh-oh, but... Um, oh, 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 don't forget. So minus, and so the, the minus, the minus from the, um, minus from the alternation, the minus here cancels, gives us a plus. Two. There's two. Then, I think we're going to make it. Yay. Um, plus, let us check it out. Eta of x, omega, oh wait a minute, no. Eta of x, gamma of y, omega of z. So, let's see here. Where do I get that from here? I want eta of x. That's either this one or that one. And I want gamma of y. This one is the one. So I get this guy. Over here, how to get eta. Eta of x is like the first one. And gamma of y, oh. Oh, I think it's this guy, yeah? If you understand my meaning. So in the, if we sort through the six things in the alternation of this guy, the last one here gets an eta of x, omega of z, gamma of y, which is what we have here. We can, so again, minus minus gives me plus, so I get two. Then, 
we have um, 2 gamma of x omega of y um, eta of z. All right, well, that will come from it's got to be this one, and it's got to be that one, right? So let's see here. Is that all right? Omega of y, bop bop. Eta of z, yep yep. And let's see here. Here I would have eta of z, yep. Omega of y, eta of x, yep. And there's two of them, like I said. And then there's <coughs> these guys. But these guys give us like minus 2 um, gamma of x, eta of y, omega of z, minus 2 eta of x, omega of y, gamma of z, minus 2 omega of x, um, gamma of y, eta of z. The twos cancel, and what we have is omega tensor eta tensor gamma plus eta tensor gamma tensor omega plus gamma tensor omega tensor eta minus gamma tensor eta tensor omega minus eta tensor omega tensor gamma minus omega tensor gamma tensor eta. There you go. That's the triple wedge product in this formalism. It all acts on x, y, z. Holds for all x, y, z, therefore that's the formula for the triple wedge of covectors. So what, this, what his conventions mean when you apply them to the wedge product of covectors is you just take the completely alternate, you just take the completely alternating, um, you know, combination of all the, the tensors that are involved. Like you just completely alternate, there's no, you just, you just permute omega, ten, omega tensor, eta tensor gamma with all the permutations that there are in three things and they give you this pattern. Because these are the cyclic permutations, these are the anti-cyclic permutations, they give a minus because it's, anyway, that's the pattern. There you go. <sighs> so that's what's, that's, that's the, uh, that's what's hiding behind the scenes here, all right? Enough of this, let's go on. So after the dust settles, we have this wonderful wedge product and um, it defines for us an exterior algebra, all right? The exterior algebra um, is a 2n dimensional algebra um, if the, the uh, you know, wedge, if the dual space is, is a, uh, um, what's the word? n-dimensional space. Now that we have all this, let's work on it over a manifold. Okay, so like, <clears throat> so if we talk about the, uh, a smooth object on the manifold for which you get a, a k covector at each point. That's a k, co, uh, a k a differential k form. So I don't know what his what's his notation. I'll get it for you guys. Let's see here. So he also has something called interior multiplication. I don't. I guess I want to talk about that at the moment. Um, so differential K form on page 360, he calls it omega, omega K of M. Ooh, my bad. I've used omega for something rather different. Oopsie doopsie. And uh, so this is a section of the, um, as he calls it, <clears throat> the K, uh, K co 
tangent, the cotangent bundle. So the, the K, K covariant tensors on the tangent bundle. Anyway, so this is just fancy, a fancy way of saying if you had alpha as an element of here, right? That would mean that alpha looks like the following. It looks like a sum, all right, of alpha i dx i. Uh, and here i is an element of i i k. I'm introducing i script k. I don't think that's in John Lee's book, but I use this. For me, this means uh, increasing multi-indices, something like that. Or, or you know, let me, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, let me probably stick with his formula since I'm not doing, I have a very good track record today. Um, so I think he just does the sum over all indices. So let's stick with his way. That's fine. Um, so let's not do this. I think that, that, that may, see, that might be an artifact of the definition I was taught in my other course. Because I'm pretty sure in my manifolds course, we put a half in the wedge. Ah, I do wonder. That's what we used to really sound. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if Lee, like Jeffrey Lee, has exactly, I wonder if he has got my, I wonder if he has the convention that I'm apparently native to, which is not this, this is not my native convention, truth be told. Dang. Such a pretty book, though. Um, I. So the, just the sum over uh, multi-indices. And so, like, this is, what's this mean, like, in more detail? This is quite monstrously the sum I1, I2, dot, 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 IK equals 1 to N of alpha I1, I2, IK, DX, I1 wedge dx I2 wedge wedge dx IK. That is a differential K form on the manifold. And here, where these, you know, where alpha I is itself a mapping from M to R. In other words, alpha I is an element of the smooth functions on the manifold. These are the component functions of the differential form. Okay? And uh, how do you find those? Well, in the current conventions, um, you just do this. I mean, alpha i is nothing more than alpha acting on like partial, partial xi1, partial, partial xi2, partial, partial xik. So you can calculate the component functions by just acting on the k-tuple of coordinate derivations. Like that. Does that make sense? I mean, modulo my uh, quibbling over the factorial, which I was really hoping to not be here doing this about the factorial. Rats. Oh. I'll, I'll get over it. Um, I think, and I've just erased all of the formulas I need to think about for this issue. <laughs> Things I just erased. Are the clarifying formulas for the questions that are bothering me? Let, let me let it go. We've worked out this and that. That's that's enough. I mean, we know what this is. Um, I can't help it. Um, actually, how much time do I have left? Oh, I don't have time. Let me not misbehave. Let's, let's go on. So the next thing you can do is you can do pullbacks. The pullback works nice here. So if I have F, you know, a smooth mapping from, say, manifold M to manifold N, and if I, say, have gamma it is, you know, let's say a P form, um, Oh, my bad. Omega P 
on n, right? Then you can pull back gamma and you will have a p form on m. And this is pretty much obviously true because we define the we define the pullback for a k-covariant tensor, right? A differential form is nothing more than a particular anti-symmetrized linear combination of k-covariant tensors, but the pullback is linear, so it just pulls through the anti-symmetrization and it still makes sense. So you just, like, <clears throat> Does, did what I just said make any sense? Or no? Do you remember we defined the pullback of a k-covariant tensor, like not an anti-symmetric one, but just a, you know, if we had a tensor that, um, so if we had, oh, yeah, yeah, um, f star, the tensor, let's call it t, right? And um, suppose it's a uh, p tensor, so it would be acting on v1 through vp, then um, we define that to be, and p is a bad choice here. Let me change that p to like a, a k again, okay? Sorry about that. I never use k as a point. I sometimes use p as a point like I'm about to. So this thing, we define to be t of, well, df, you know, uh, dfp v1, dot, 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 df at the point P of VP of VK, right? So like the pullback of the tensor at the point P, we just push forward the vectors and let the tensor on N act on the push forwards of the tangent vectors um, from M. And so doing, we define a tensor on M in a kind of sneaky way. But the thing is, if we can do it for a tensor, a differential form, right, is nothing more than an anti like an anti-symmetrized linear combination of tensors, right? So the fact that the pullback is linear and we know how to pull back a tensor means that we know how to pull back a form. And the cool thing is that <clears throat> more than that, you can prove, I think it's beyond my mental capability to do it at the moment, but the pullback of like, you know, alpha wedge gamma, guess what? It's the pullback of alpha wedged with the pullback of gamma. So like, you can either take the wedge, then pull back, or you can pull back and then take the wedge. Either way, it's, you're good to go. This is pretty much immediately true because the, this property we had for the tensor, you remember? Like the pullback of the tensor product was the tensor product of the pullbacks, we had that. So if that's true and the wedge product is just a particular linear combination of tensors as we saw over there, right? Then of course this is also true just by <coughs> the linearity of the pullback. And um, so, and he has, and also lemma 14.16, 4, he actually has a formula which says that how do you actually calculate the pullback of a differential form? You shove the formulas for the, pull, the map into the, into the form and just work it out, just like we did already. So the pullback calculation is very much like we already did. Um, here's an important one. Uh, Corollary. Um, oh, I need a spot to write this thing. I guess I can write it up at the top of the board. If you've got two charts, two overlapping smooth charts, right? So like, uh, let's put it up here. So here's like you, here's you tilde, you know, so you got like your your x chart and your 